So as I mentioned, this is our final nature talk of the season, but we've recorded the vast majority of the previous nature talks, so you can watch them at your leisure on the YouTube channel for Naples Parks and Rec. So then at this point, I'm going to introduce our wonderful guest speaker for today. Camila Perez graduated in 2004 with a bachelor's from Florida Gulf Coast University. In her 15 years with pollution control, she has worked as a lake manager, landscape advisor, arborist, and environmental educator. What she enjoys most about her job is inspiring all ages to do their part to protect local water bodies. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Becky. So I have given this presentation a couple times, but um, it's still kind of a new one. This is more of a motivational speech, kind of. Um, but a quick introduction of me, she, she gave a good, you know, bio, but I am a master gardener, master naturalist. I have my arborist license. I really love plants. So I'm trying to kind of make that motivational, like, um, breach, you know, to, to kind of integrate water resources and water protection into the landscape side too, so that we understand the ties there. So this one is that, uh, where, what, why, and how of protecting water resources. So when we talk about water resources, I, I just want us to step back a little and think about what water resources are we talking about? Are we talking about the water resources in the wetlands? Are we talking about the beach? You know, those water resources? Are we talking about our drinking water? Are we talking about the water that we use? And, you know, everybody talks about conserving the water in our house. Or are we talking about the water on our streets or in our ponds and in our neighborhood? Like, what water are we talking about? And for me, actually, let me go back one. I'm trying to get us to think about all of that water is the same and stop thinking about how everything is separate because it really is all the same water resource that we need to think of um, as, as something we need to protect together. So I just wanted to see where you guys at, were at with my thought check number one. In an average Flor Florida household, about 50% of the daily water consumption is used for what purpose? What do you guys think? Do you think it's for toilets? for bathing, drinking, cooking, landscape, irrigation, or clothes and dishes. Usually when I've asked this question, I get about half and half, but it is, there was an, an IFA study done a few years back and most of the water that was reported was actually used for landscape purposes. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it here, right? We get about 56 inches of rain a year here, but most of it falls in the rainy season and all the rest of the year, we're trying to keep all of these landscapes lush. So we end up using a lot of our water resources for landscape purposes. So I want us to take a step back and I know it may seem a little juvenile, but I want us to think about the water cycle because this is where I think, you know, that we forget about how everything is tied together. So if we actually think about the water cycle back when we were in, you know, elementary school, you know, you've got all these processes you know, going on all the time. And water is a renewable resource, you know, via the water cycle. But if we don't understand that, you know, it's stored in different places and then it goes to the clouds, you know, with condensation, but then as it falls, we've got all of these different variables that can come out of stormwater runoff and then infiltration. And so that's where all of our resources are kind of the same, right? Because if we don't have good infiltration, um, Let's see, if we don't have good infiltration here, then we're not going to have good drinking water supply. And that's where we start to have, you know, shortages. And we're like right now, everybody's got to stop doing the, um, the overuse of water for spring, the irrigation systems. And it's because that's where all, all the water's coming from. 96% of Collier County is actually drinking water from the ground. And we're also using those resources. A, a ton of it is also being used to, to irrigate our lawns. So this is the world of stormwater. And then we also have to talk about stormwater runoff. So as we have precipitation falls from the sky, it's obviously gonna hit the ground, but there's so many different ways that it can go, right? If I, if I direct my gutters in my front yard to go to the driveway, it's going down the driveway and out into the street where it disappears into some drain. And then we, we stop thinking about it, but we have to start thinking about where is it going once it gets into that drain too which is kind of the premise of this talk. So what is stormwater and why should we care? All right, stormwater runoff is actually the number one carrier of pollutants. So if you think about, you know, the rain falls, but what is it 
you know, lingering with as it, as it hits the ground. It, it's, you know, going to fall on any chemicals that we might have used on our lawn, any extra fertilizer that our plants didn't end up using. And it, of course, you know, floatable pollution and trash and all of those other things. But it's really important for us to think about all of the water as one resource is what I'm trying to get across, I think, to people these days. So let's talk about st stormwater for one second, just so everyone understands that in Collier County and in most of Florida too, stormwater and septic or sewage water is, is separate. We have something called an MS4 or a separate storm sewer system. And in, in places in like, uh, you know, New York and other uh, Northern states, they combine the stormwater and the wastewater into one resource, and then it goes to a treatment plant and it gets cleaned. Okay, here that does not happen because again, we get almost 60 inches of rain a year. It is way too much water for anyone to be able to treat uh, in a timely fashion to be able to reuse. So the water is actually going into these stormwater pipes and you'll see this one here says storm. So this is untreated rainwater and all of the pollutants that it might pick up as it's going through the road um, and through the system. When it says sewer, that's the sanitary sewer or the flush water. And these things are completely separate. So we can't just call it, it's going to the sewer because the storm sewer is very different from the sanitary here in Collier County. And in most of Florida, it's all separate. And that, that is based on how much precipitation and rain we get. So what do these structures look like? And we get complaints about, uh, complaints about swales constantly. So this is a standard swale. Okay, and I want everybody to start thinking of swales as a resource too. That could be, a, 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 you know, nobody wants the water to sit in that for very long, but during the rainy season, it's going to be there as long as it's still raining, right? Because this is part of our um, infiltration system. And if we don't let the water sit in those, storm, in those stormwater swales for long enough for them to infiltrate or percolate into the ground, then we're losing all of that water resource. So it, when it's just going through pipes, you know, it's, it's going to end up somewhere else. But if we can allow these swales to actually be a resource for us too, they'll give us more water for drinking water purposes at a later date and time. So that's one of them. And then, of course, everybody knows these, you know, uh, curb inlets. And all of those, again, have pipes that are connected. And those, those pipes are going to carry the water to another location. That's just another gutter. Or, or curb. And then these are drop inlets or gutters. Again, same thing. These are usually in parking lots um, and they're going to take the water as fast as possible off of the land so that we don't flood and, and be able to take it to another location. And in most cases, it's going to a pond. So let's talk about these for a second. This is one of the ponds that I manage for the county off of Yarberry and Orange Blossom. But have you guys ever seen these boxes? Those boxes are actually weirs, okay? They're a control structure that is allowing the water to sit in this pond for enough time for the water to percolate, you know, into the ground and to use up some of the pollutants that end up in these ponds. And then there's going to be a hole in here like on, the, on one side of, of the box. On this one, it's on the back side. So there's going to be like an orifice on the back, and then there's going to be a pipe that's going to connect this thing out to a canal. And I think it's so hard for people to like, you know, think of all of the connections, but if everybody understands by the end of my talk that everything's connected, then I think I've succeeded here today. So those, those pipes and those, so what happens is the water stacks up in those ponds. We try to keep it, the engineers, you know, design it to keep it for enough time for the water to, you know, get cleaned and to store it for infiltration, but then it's gonna lead out eventually during heavy rains into a canal like this. This canal is off Oaks Boulevard and it actually ends up connecting out to Cocahatchee River, which is on the other side of Immokalee Road and Cocahatchee River ends up going down to Wiggins State Park, you know, to Clam Pass and through those areas. So eventually everything is intermingling and going out to here. So do you, have you guys ever seen these at the beaches? Okay, so these are storm drains. Um, this is not for Cocahatchee River, but this is a standard storm drain that is gonna be carrying rainwater and everything that's picked up in it that isn't captured somewhere along the, the way into the Gulf of Mexico and out. Again, too much water for anybody to be able to keep back. And if we wanna live here, we have to learn to, to work with these, uh, these functions and the, and the infrastructure. 
So my talk, right, is called Where Does the Green Grass Grow? And so I want to get back to that connection as to the reason why I'm pushing this, this term. So the green grass grows around our ponds, right? And then it gr grows in our landscape. So let's talk about ponds. In Collier County, as of last year, there's 4,564 ponds, stormwater ponds that we have dug out so that we have the fill that we need to be able to you know, build up the landscape and be able to live here without being underwater. Most of Collier County a few hundred years ago would have been wetland swampland, right? But if we can understand that these are a resource that's necessary and we need to think about the way that we manage them uh, is extremely important. So most people seem to want this like, you know, uh, sandy shoreline, like it's supposed to be a clear water be you know, beach lake from the north. And here in Collier County, we really need people to start managing them differently. You get, guys can understand if you've got a shoreline like this, right, where it's just turf to water's edge. I know nobody wants their views obstructed, but if you're mowing the lawn right there at that at that interface, all of those grass clippings are likely going to end up in the water. And that's where a lot of our pollution and nutrient problems come from, is the way that we manage these, these banks. And nobody wants to see the, that this stuff either, you know, the filamentous algae and the grasses. So there's lots of things that I try to do when I'm working with communities. We try to do a lot of community outreach where we work with homeowners associations and try to get them to plant these shorelines so that you don't see the filamentous algae. Sorry, keep going forward. But this is filamentous algae or paraphyton or something mixed in here, along with like different grasses. Some of them are invasive, some of them aren't. But if we can hide this stuff with other aquatic plants so that people don't hate the way they, you know, have to view it, um, it's better than this, right? Because you've got, you know, a couple tufts of plants over here that are trying to hold on in this sad little soil, but they're not really holding the banks in place and protecting from erosion for the long term. And it's not very, um, it's not very aesthetically pleasing. I think we can all agree. Um, but thinking of these ponds in a, in a fashion where oh, it's just a small area that we can get the landscapers away, where we're just doing some native plant beds, you know, with maybe some ornamental stuff even mixed in there and trying to keep the, the, that turf grass. Turf doesn't, isn't an aquatic plant. It doesn't want to be in water. And for some reason, we keep trying to tell it it has to be in water. And that's where we have all this erosion problems is related to the turf grass. Uh, receding because it's just not happy being in water. So you really have to pick those right plants um, to be able to go into these landscapes and hold the banks in place and protect from runoff and erosion. So thought check number two, Collier County, what do you think the major pollutants are for our watersheds out of my list there? It's nutrients, heavy metals, and bacteria are our primary problems here. So bacteria actually let me go to my next slide. Bacteria is actually the major one right now. And we're pollution control, not my section because I'm the education section, but um, our other groups are actually working with the state to figure out what we're going to do about the bacteria impairments. Coquihatchie River, which is along Immokalee Road, if you're like driving on Immokalee, it would be on the north side of the road. And it connects all the way out towards Corkscrew Swamp, actually drains into, Cork, into uh, Coquihatchie and out. Um, but we've been trying to track where the bacteria has been coming from up there for decades. And we still have not been able to get a like firm source track on that. Now it's not our only watershed that's impaired for bacteria, but we're talking about E. coli in some places, Enterococcus and others. And um, what's the third one? Total, total and fecal coliform in some of the others. So one watershed might have, you know, fecal coliform as a problem. Another watershed might have enterococcus as the problem, but all of the like outgoing waters, watching bacteria levels continue to increase over time. So that one's a big one that we're working on. Copper is another big one. And that's another reason why I put so much emphasis on the ponds. Copper is a common algicide used for treating filamentous algae. So we're trying, we've done a lot of work in the last like five years trying to get communities and their lake managers to understand that filamentous algae is not all bad and all of the stuff you see growing in the pond is not all bad and that we have to stop using copper as a heavy metal to treat that and keep the clear water because what we're doing is actually polluting all of the oysters in the, in the bays and then we end up with these, you can't really see the color so well, but we end up with this bright bluish green oyster um, 
that has taken on way too much heavy metal during its filtration processes. One is nutrients, like you guys had guessed, where it could be total nitrogen in one of them. It could be, you know, um, nitrite or some other constituent of the nitrogen cycle in another. So some of them, it's just chlorophyll, which is a pigment from uh, plants and algae. And all of that leads back to nutrient issues. So how can we protect our water resources? Well, I've already said it, but think about these ponds as a resource for drinking water. If we, if we think about the way we're managing them or mismanaging them, and then try to think about how much water is filtering through these ponds into our drinking water aquifers, I think we would manage them a little differently. Um, so protecting that waterfront, keeping the grass clippings uh, are just break down to extra nutrients for algae blooms. So keeping the nutrients out of the water, um, making sure that we actually protect that, that resource, you know, for uh, future use. And then um, this is my lake watch pitch here. So I'm the lake watch trainer for Collier County. Um, it's, a, it's an IFAS program too, where if you're in a homeowner's assistance, and that has ponds and you actually have like a committee that, that's interested in trying to figure out what your um, nutrient issues might be in your pond, I can go out there and University of Florida supplies all of the equipment for you guys to take uh, regular visibility readings. So you get out there with like a secchi disc and you, how, you know, what's the visibility? Can I see into the water column or is it completely clouded over with uh, algae that, you know, is making the water turbid. And then you collect a couple bottles. We submit the bottles to Gainesville. They do the analysis and then they give you back total nitrogen and total phosphorus. But understanding that if you're not going to get in the water and do it, that somebody probably needs to be actually monitoring the health of the, the lakes and not just throwing chemicals at it all the time. Because it's, it's always easy, right, to just like decide you're going to um, just treat something to make it pretty, but you're not really figuring out what the problem is. Um, in a lot of cases, it is like a nutrient impairment that's causing so much overgrowth. And then the last thing is to think about UF IFAS as a resource. And I know I get on my University of Florida pedestal, but, but you know, I am a master gardener, so I try to advocate for the nine principles of Florida-friendly landscaping, which I did bring some info back there on. And they, they have a bunch of resources that you can use for... Um, developing good HOA contracts. So like making sure the landscapers are doing what you tell them and you know what chemicals are you putting out? What is the fertilizer that you're actually putting out? Because in Collier County, no matter where you're at in Collier County, you're not allowed to apply phosphorus anymore without a soil test. And if you guys don't have it outlined in your actual documents, you, you as the property owners and association are the ones responsible for the way that the landscape treats your your grounds. So if they're using a, you know, a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, which, you know, I doubt anybody is, but um, if they're using even 2% phosphorus, it's actually a violation of the, of the local ordinances. Um, but understanding, you know, that you can empower yourselves to make sure that, that they're all doing what you pay them to do. Because plants are amazing, right? They, they absorb the excess water uh, from our landscapes, and then they give us oxygen, but then they also give water back to the atmosphere too. So if we're losing all of our plants, we're actually impacting the water cycle um, in a lot of ways. And the way we manage them keeps them healthy and ha helps them with our resources. So I just want you guys to think for a minute, do you actually monitor rainfall? You know, do you have a rain gauge or a rain sensor or anything? Um, because it's super important if you're actually irrigating, because we only need about three quarters of an inch a week here. And a lot of times, especially in summer, we get way more than that. And the systems need to actually be triggered to turn off. Um, they should have, you know, timers that can be adjusted easily. They need to have rain moisture sensors so that if it's actually raining during the time that it's supposed to go off, that the sensor will trigger and it'll, it'll shut it off. Because again, if you think about that as our drinking water, we're losing that drinking water resource because you're overwatering your plants. And then watching for overspray because if, there, if it's spraying onto concrete or even into a water body, it's not helping your plants at all. And it's just another transport, right? It's more stormwater transport that's carrying more pollutants off the ground. Um, and I brought some of the rack cards for, um, City of Naples, because they actually allow rain gardens to be built in some of their swales um, in the city limits. So if you guys are in the city limits, you know, reach out to City of Naples or even me. Um, 
or Becky probably, about plants and Andy, um, about plants that you can put in some of these swales and make, you know, a rain garden or a bio swale in your front yard. Um, because keeping the, the water at the source is always going to be the best thing for the environment, right? Because if we, if it's, Shuttling off, it just has more momentum to pick up more stuff. And if we can keep it at the source, whether it's the gutter, um, whether it's your swale a little longer, then those po pollutants have a chance of getting assimilated before they impact our water. Um, and irrigation, obviously, over irrigation is a huge problem um, as far as you know, drinking water supplies and off. But I already mentioned uh, the University of Florida. So I'd just like to say, Florida landscaping has those nine principles where you put the plant in the right place, it uses less water, um, it needs less fertilizer and pesticides, and that's going to um, help all of us in the long run. But they're, all of their principles come back to um, water resources is the main focus of that program. I'm looking for signs. My neighbor does this, and I think I finally got him to down the irrigation, but everyone complains about dollar weed and what can I do about dollar weed? Dollar weed is an aquatic plant. So if you just reduce the amount of water, dollar weed will usually uh, decline. And then this little blue flower actually also an aquatic plant. So knowing like what things are popping up around, you know, irrigation heads will actually tell you that you're over irrigating right next to those sprinkler heads if you're getting too many of these type of aquatic plants popping up. So look for that. Take control of your irrigation. I know HOAs, I, I get the constant comment back where the HOA controls that. Uh, the watering should always be done in the early morning hours and never in late hours, unless it's a new, you know, vegetation they've planted or that you can enforce um, if they're not doing it right. Know what chemicals are being added to your yard. Removing, like if you've got areas of turf that are declining and they're, it's not happy in that spot, get rid of it. Add stuff that is the right plant in that right place to be able to, you know, just swap it out. Um, what, what I try to advocate is that you have, you know, the open spaces where you need it. If you've got a dog you need to walk or kids need to play, those are the areas that you're going to maintain turf. And then all of the other areas, you know, try to put in plants that are going to require a little bit less maintenance after you get them established. It can be a lot of work at the beginning, trying to pick that right plant and really make it happy. But after that, it should, you know, be a lot less effort. Um, and then stop adding hard surfaces. So I, I know this is a hard one, but I just keep thinking, okay, we're, I, I want a little pavement over here for my golf cart. And I want a little hard, you know, patio over here for my, uh, my fire pit. And then over here, I want a little hard surface for the kids to be able to play basketball. And I know you have uses. But if you think about all of the hard surfaces and impervious area, we keep adding to our own, our own personal yard. You're, we're taking away from that area that you can actually use for water infiltration and, and, um, and percolation and more water resources and allowing for these, I call them mini ecosystems. Next slide. Yes. My mini ecosystems. So like picking out, you know, where you want your, and need those hard areas and, and rock. Um, and then not using rock all over the place, you know, because it's harder for water to get into the ground and get used up, but adding plants instead of just continuously adding more hard surfaces. So if we all just think about our own yards for a minute, I think it's easier to translate that info to neighbors and to an HOA. Um, so yeah, here's my little like courtyard of the area in between houses. I get a lot of homeowners associations that struggle with like that highly shaded area in between these like very close dwellings. And what do they do about it? Well, you just gotta pick the right plant that's gonna live in there because turf doesn't wanna be in shade. So you have to rethink, re rethink the system. Uh, here's a couple other examples. This is a stormwater pond. There's, you know, a pipe end right here and this is fully planted. Yes, it's got some riprap, it, you know, hard rock and surfaces are needed in some cases for erosion, but try to use plants to hold the banks in place as much as possible. And then this is actually my master gardener coordinator's yard that he had in Cape Coral. And I know it may seem a little overwhelming to some people, but basically having more planting beds and less turf is the idea of being Florida friendly um, because the plants are going to, after over time, the plants are going to require less maintenance. You know, you've got stuff that barely needs to be pruned. Um, and then you've just got small areas of turf that you've got to manage. 
All right, so this is my, my summarizing. There are the nine principles of Florida Friendly. Um, the Master Gardeners, we, we teach these classes periodically. So if you want to invite us out to like a association meeting, we can even do it for like all of the members uh, for annual meetings or whatever and try to go over what the actual principles are so that you can try to advocate for them in your community. Um, and being Florida friendly does reduce nutrient runoff because there is, you know, principle two and three are both related to using less water for less runoff and less for less chemicals and fertilizer, um, which are important for um, nutrient control. And then taking control of that irrigation system is something everybody needs to be in charge of. Reducing the turf, adding more native plants, and then knowing what chemicals are being applied to your neighborhood. Don't just let lake managers or landscapers say, hey, "I, you know, I'm killing the weeds." That's the one I hear in the in the community ponds all the time. Um, they just write on some paper, "Oh yeah, Lake One killed the weeds." Like they they're, they need to know what they're killing because a lot of times they're killing native stuff that's just beneficial because the neighbors don't want to see plants in the pond. Um, and they need to tell you what they're using for it too. Like, are you using copper sulfate for killing everything? Are you using some fluoridone or some other like, you know, chemical that's, you know, not safe for anyone? So why should my fish be swimming in it? Um, and then if you see things that just don't seem right, I just wanted you guys to know that pollution control is out there. Um, we do respond to pollution complaints all year long. So there is, you can dial 311 from anywhere in Collier County limits and it go to like the non-emergency service. Because it takes all of us understanding that that water is going to get into the pipes and end up going out to the beach potentially eventually. And for us to all know that there is something we can do about it. For me, I hope you guys enjoyed the talk. I did bring a bunch of stuff back there, but the main, my main pitch is just that we're here to help as the education team. So if there's anything that I can help you guys with or your communities in the future, just take our business card and let us know what we can do to help. If you are enjoying this on YouTube, please like and subscribe for more. You, you actually, the, some of, they're, they're obviously non-porous. So the paver itself is not, but it, I have seen people use pavers and they'll like leave that gap, the opening in between. And you, you say the pavers are no, they're not even lime rock. When we, when we did the, um, the stormwater utility some years ago, that lime rock kept coming up. And if you pour water on lime rock, you'll see it's not going anywhere anytime soon. So sure. There is a factor where eventually it's going to evaporate back into the into the air, but it's not percolating into groundwater. If you left the grooves around and you're not putting like a base rock, because once you put those base paver uh, materials, a lot of cases you've already, you know, you've already done the, the it's not porous at that, at that point anyway, but there are other, it's called low impact development where there's um, imper, um, porous or pervious pavers that can be purchased. There's a whole nother like set of maintenance criteria with that though, because eventually over time they will get um, like sediment in them. So they have to be vacuumed and, um, but there are other techniques out there for trying to make porous situations. In fact, for city of Naples, you know, that uh, University of Miami Bascom Eye Center, that actually, they have pervious pavers installed in that parking lot. So if you go in there, you'll see that you can see a little bit of like, um, large stone in between each of the pavers, and it's supposed to be a porous solution. Uh, the only way of testing it really is you have to have some type of piezometer or like, you know, something that's measuring the water flow underneath, but it's, um, it's an attempt at least to do something that's more porous and more Florida friendly. So the, the swales are definitely a function that we have to have. But uh, like I mentioned earlier about if you're in the city of Naples, city of Naples has more ability um, to allow people to do these like bioswale type um, things. There are some pockets, like I think Thomason and Bayshore, we have some areas that the swales, we've tried to do bioswales. Until, until everybody can work together with like road maintenance and department of transportation to make sure that we're not, that we're changing the management of those swales, I would say it's a futile attempt. I mean, we can, it has to be a wetland wildflower, right? Because it's gotta be something that wants to grow there. But until we stop mowing the swales, it, it's gonna be, it's gonna take more ideology and dreamers to try to bring a team together, I think.
um, I'd love to be part of that if you want to attempt to get us, you know, all in the same place at someday. I mean, we, we are part of road maintenance. So there might be like some sections. What I've been talking to the road maintenance and stormwater people about more recently is doing more depressed medians and, and sway on the side of like, like Livingston, we did a pretty good job of like sending all of the water to that huge like conveyance along the east side of Livingston Road. Uh, and when you're going like north of Pine Ridge, that all of the water from the road goes over there. But I see other communities in like Sarasota and even Lee County using more of the swales as a bioswale and sending more water that way instead of pipes and, and inlet. And I think it's going to require a lot more community um, intervention and ideas for us to get there. Well, one of the statistics I was supposed to say in there was that the study from IFAS actually showed that they're thinking by 2025, 4.2 billion gallons of water is going to be needed for um, population in Florida from public drinking water supplies. So I think drinking water is going to become more of a problem over time. But I, because we're not in public utilities, I'm not sure what the production. I know we're always working on new production wells and, you know, conservation efforts, but I mean, one of the reasons why Aliyah and I have this job is to try to, you know, she, she's been doing a bunch of social media posts right now for us about conservation of water because it, um, was it last month, right? Was water conservation month. Oh, it's this month ending now. So like it, I, I know there's, there's always, um, efforts going there, but I haven't heard anything as to whether we're, we've got like a problem that's imminent. I know Miami is starting to have more concerns like that. So, and I heard what Cape Coral, they were starting to scale back all the irrigation because they're having problems. So just things to think about in the future. If you are enjoying this on YouTube, please like and subscribe for more.